Praise the Lord and greetings to you all in the name of Jesus, our Lord. And we are once again happy to be in His presence, uh, to serve Him with our praises and worship and all that we could do for Him. And I know you all took part in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a wonderful thing because this is the privilege given by our Lord Jesus Christ to take, to become one with Him. This is such a privilege that no one ever does. Any big people, they will do not want their subordinates to become like them and take part in them or become one of them. But our Father in heaven loved us so much. He not only loved us just by words, and he gave his only begotten son. He did not spare him. It means he did not just take this gift. He did not say that. He actually put him to death on the cross and on the cross, our Lord Jesus Christ suffered for our sins and made us what we are today. And for what he has done on the cross gives us the privilege to become sons and daughters of God. And this makes us heirs of all God's you know, inheritance. Everything belongs to God. Well, we cannot all inherit right away on earth. We are being prepared to become the right inheritance while we are on earth in all that we do, <clears throat> in all that way that we carry on our salvation, which is very, very important, right? So we'll take you to the Word. Today I'm going to take you through a very simple subject, as a subject. And the title of my message is, Love is the Greatest. And I've, that word comes from the First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, talks like this. First Corinthians 13, 13. And now abide faith, hope. No, now abide faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. Generally, we say faith is very important because we can do everything and anything and nothing will be impossible. But the word today tells us very clearly the love is most important. So, however... It's not that you do not know what is love is. You know it. You also know, know that you have to love. Love God and love people. But we'll try to establish into our hearts where do we stand with the measure God will measure our love with. Are we close to His measurement? Or are we just somewhere far away? So let us understand by the scriptures where we stand. If you are in the right place, you are a blessed person. If you are not, you're still blessed because you heard the word, you will hear the word, and you heard the word. At the end, you can make up your mind that you will love like our Father in heaven loved us. That's the whole thing. That's the whole message. But we'll go through lots of scriptures that will help us to establish the reason why we are here this morning. Amen. Let's go to this verse again. First uh, Peter chapter 4, from 7 to 10. First Peter Chapter 4, verse 7 to 10, I will read. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. It's a clear message to us. It says, the end of all things is at hand. Though it was said 2,000 years ago, today, this word is more real to us. The things, I always, as, as I always say, the things that are happening around us, the news, the, 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 the political situation, and uh, the pandemic that's going on, the sufferings people are going through, and all those things. Other than that, we also have this, uh, uh, this uh, scripture in uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3. If you read the whole, I'm not going to do this this morning. It talks about, what kind of people will be on earth in the last days? We say we are in the perilous times. The love will grow cold. People will be, you know, haters of God and lovers of themselves. And they will love pleasure more than God himself. And those kind of days we are living. Yes, the whole world loves pleasure more than God. And not only the people in the world, even the believers, or they call themselves believers, such people also love the pleasure more than God. 
and all such things are happening in the present days. And it's important for us to know. And what it says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious. He says, be serious with whatever you do. And watchful in your prayers. Means there is, it's, it's, it's asking us to be continuously, be serious, watchful uh, in your prayers. And in, in, be in your prayers. That's what it means. And verse 8, it says, above all things, this is very important, have fervent love for one another. In the last days, it's important for us to have fervent love. Not an ordinary love. Fervent love. Your love must, be, it, it should emerge out of you with great fervence. You must, in other words, your love must be purposeful. You must tell yourself, I must love. Even though I don't like a person, I still must love. Even though I have no power to love, I'm weak, I still must love. That is what is being fervent. Being willing to love anybody, anywhere, whatever you are doing. That's very important, brothers and sisters. Today, this thought of loving others, whether you love them in reality or not, whether you like their deeds, whether they, what they speak, what they do, and your love should not be based on that. Your love should be so fervent, it should overpower the natures of people around you. Fervent love for one another, that's what he says. And for love will cover a multitude of sins. Why? Why should you love? Why should you have love? That love will cover multitude of sins. Now, how many of you want, to, want your sins to be covered or to be closed and closed forever? Only one thing that can cover your sins, which will make you eligible to enter the eternal kingdom. Love will cover your sins. Even if you're committed sins, knowingly, unknowingly, still, if you have love and begin to exercise that love, you know, what happens is your love will cover your sins. Not only your sins, it will cover the sins of others. Because you have love, you will not expose anybody's shame, anybody's shortcomings, anybody's problems. You, you will not try to expose them. Therefore, their sins are covered even in the presence of the Lord. Because you love. Hallelujah. So love will cover multitude of sins. And verse 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Being hospitable is one thing. Many of us are very hospitable. Sometimes some people do grumble being hospitable. Certain things, they can be hospitable. They will give lots, they make lots of food. When the guest doesn't eat the food enough, oh, we made so much, we wasted so much. That's grumbling. With your, if you have love, you should think, yeah, they could not. It doesn't matter. I can use it for the next day. And that's love. Verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to another, un, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We all have gifts. We have the Holy Sp gifts of the Spirit. Other than the gifts of the Spirit, we also have our gifts, lots of gifts, by which means actually talents or the virtues which are in us, by which we can love others, help others, will meet people, encourage people. We do some administration in the church. We can sometimes clean the place or we can, you know, just reach out to those in need. All these are gifts that you have. What he says is, as you have received a gift from the Lord, minister it, use it in other words. Don't keep your gift that you have within yourself and rather, you know, minister to others, one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God's grace is manifold, not just one kind. It's not only just send His Son, Jesus Christ, if you believe He's saving. In many ways, He's forgiving our sins. It's manifold grace. So now question is comes, what is this love which is so greatest? What kind of love that we need to have? What kind of love should manifest in us? Let's go to the scripture again. Book of Matthew, chapter 22. From 37, I will read... However, 
What I want to tell you is before 37 verse, what happened is there was these people, Sadducees and and uh, uh, Pharisees together uh, in front of Lord Jesus Christ. And Sadducees, as some of you know, all of you know, they do not believe in resurrection of the dead. So Jesus actually had to tell them, yes, the dead will surely be resurrected. And therefore... The Pharisees became very happy that Jesus actually spoke to them the right thing because they don't agree with each other. Pharisees believe the dead will be resurrected. So however, one of the Pharisees felt happy but however wanted to uh, make himself big or just wanted to test Jesus. Come on, Jesus, tell us, out of all the commandments, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus did not say anything humbly and simply. Verse 37, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And verse 38, this is the first and great commandment. And verse 39, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So this scripture is what is a base scripture which tells us there are two kinds of love or two aspects of love. Many times Pastor Dennis used to demonstrate it to us or used to tell like the cross is where, on, on, where our Lord Jesus Christ died. It has a vertical you know, column and a horizontal column. That's what the cross is. So these two loves here you see here is one is vertical love that is loving God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength. Here it says strength in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the law in the book of Deuteronomy it says with all your uh, sorry here it says uh, here it says mind in the original uh, uh, in, in Deuteronomy it says strength. So the mind Jesus calls it mind because our strength is in our mind. Our strength is in our mind. How do I say that? If you decide anything in your mind, you will be able to do it. That's your strength. It's all how you decide in your hand, heart. So why Jesus said is, if you want to love God, you need to make a decision to give a, a fervent love unto the Father in heaven with all your heart, with all your soul, and use all your mind towards God. That's what it means. But this mind, the strength that comes through this mind, we use it in our day-to-day -day life a lot. Sometimes we want to sleep. We use our mind to sleep. But the same person, while sleeping, he thinks, oh, I have to go to work. In one shot, he gets up and starts getting ready, even though he was lazy just a second before. And what you'd make up in your mind, you will do it. Hallelujah. So that's what it means. So our love, our vertical love is towards God our Father, which should be in this fashion. We'll read more scriptures about it. And the horizontal love is towards the people around us. That's what exactly Jesus did. Jesus loved God the Father by obedience, total obedience to his command that he gave himself to die on the cross. He humbled himself. That's what book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 onwards until 9 it says. He humbled to die on the cross and God exalted him above all names. That every knee should bow before him and every tongue should con confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because he humbled. So he loved God, that's one thing. But he showed love to God at the same time. His love was shown to all of us. On the cross he said this word, Into your hands I surrender my spirit. That is what loving God. But before that he said, Father, forgive these people, because they do not know what they are doing. That is his love. And those who are around him 
tortured him, nailed him to the cross, they scourged him, his back was like the plowed field, and all the suffering he went through for the, about the same people, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. This is love. If you love those who love you, it's okay. But to love those who put you into suffering, who caused all kinds of turmoil in your life, that is what is horizontal love, loving anybody and everybody. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. If you do not take this into your heart this morning, you are going to miss something in your spiritual life. Hallelujah. Now the command of love, to love God is not just for us to Christians. It was given to the Jewish people, the Israelites, in the old time. In the book, as I mentioned to you, book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's what it says there. So this command was for the Jewish people, and as well as to us, because Jesus emphasized it with his own mouth, that you should love God. And you love your neighbor too. Now, the question comes, how to love God? Or how can we express our love to God? You may have these questions in your heart. And I'll take you through scriptures. The scriptures will answer us very clearly that how we can love God. Book of John, chapter 14, verse 15. It's one of my favorite uh, book and these chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17, my favorite chapters also, I, as always say, book of Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7, 2, where we can see the heart of Jesus for us. Amen? So if you, then let's, let's read this verse, verse 15, John 14, 15, if you love me, what did he say? If you love me, ask yourself, if you love God, if I love God, then what he says? Keep my commandments. It's a clear scripture, brothers and sisters. There is nothing here and there. The only way that we can express our love to God is by keeping his commands, rather obeying his commands. That's what is very clear to us. Further, his he reinforces in the same chapter, verse 21, verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them. First of all, he who has. Ask yourself if you have the commandments of God with you. You can say, I have a Bible. Good, wonderful. Bible contains the commandments of our Father in heaven and our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, if who, uh, he who has my commandments and keeps them. Now question yourself, do you keep them? Do you keep them? Uh, but I do not know all of them at all times. So you need to make a, 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 a what you call, a, a, a positive effort to know what are those commandments God wants us to follow. Okay, let me continue. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Very clear. Nothing here and there. Only he who keeps my commandments or does my commandments, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. It's so crystal clear, brothers and sisters, our love to show to our God is only one way. It is to obey the commands of our Lord God Almighty. And I'll take you to another scripture. Epistle of John, first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. He, he, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments. If you say, I know God, I know, I, I know, I know, I know God, if you keep on saying. And if he does not keep his commandments, it says, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. It's so clear. If you know God, you will keep 
His commandments. That's why it is said in Proverbs, not in one place, in several places, not only in Proverbs, in Psalms, and also in the book of Job. This one word has been repeated a number of times. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you fear Lord, you actually love Him. Your fear turns into love. And that love and His love coming upon you, you will become so confident in your life. You will never live with fear on earth when you fear the Lord. That's very clear. Verse 5, But whoever keeps His word, truly the love of God is perfected in Him. When you keep His word, the love of God is perfected in you. You can have love and you can have perfect love. We all have love. We show love in various places. Some of us show our love only to our family, maybe to our wives or husbands or our children, our mothers and fathers and so on. That is also love. Some of us love our friends. And some of us love maybe the church members, maybe some acquaintances or relatives. That is also love. But there's something called perfect love. What it says, he who keeps his word, truly love, uh, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Means the perfect love is different than a regular love. And what is that perfect love? We'll go further and we'll learn also. Same book of John, the first epistle, chapter 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God. For this is the love. What is love of God? For this is the love of God. What? That who, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. Truly, I want to assure you, the commandments of God is not at all burdensome. Many people think, oh, it's difficult. You know why it is difficult? Let me tell you. Because your priorities in life, your likes and desires, which are strongly embedded in, 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 embedded in yourselves, which are so fleshly minded. When you are so fleshly minded, your desires are so contrary to the Spirit of God. And that is the time you'll find it to obey the command of God. That is the reason we always say, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It means walking in the Spirit means led by the Holy Spirit. But we are so fleshly minded. Our flesh is so strong in us. If you, unless you crucify your flesh, unless you crucify yourself, it will be difficult for you to obey the commands of God. But you have, if you say, I, it's, it's not me who lives, it's, it's, it's God who lives in me. I have been crucified. If you'll find the book of uh, uh, Galatians chapter 2.20, I think, uh, or Colossians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified, it says. It's no longer I who live. God lives in me, Galatians 2.20. Hallelujah. It is God who lives in me. If you are that person, if you are not that person, remember today, you are not qualified to be raptured. Let's make it very, very clear. If you are not that person who can say, I have been crucified. If you keep saying, I have been crucified, that means your flesh has been crucified, your thoughts, your desires, your mental ways have been not crucified, your own ways are not crucified, that means it's you who are living, not God living in you. You are not certified or you are not having the right to be in the kingdom of God or to be raptured. If you are a person Waiting to be raptured, you will take this word into your heart very seriously. This morning, my brother, my sister, to tell the truth, I'm here to tell the truth. Without telling the truth, it's not going to work. There's only one way. You must learn to crucify yourself. And daily you must be crucified. Paul says, I'm being crucified daily. Or I'm dying every day. 
Are you that person? Because yourself, when it comes, when your selfish things come and stand in your head, and you want to do things your way, and you begin to know that's not right, when you don't do them, you are allowing yourself to be crucified. And that's what God wants us to be. And then you will say, His commandments are not burdensome. Again, second epistle of John, verse 6. Second epistle of John, verse 6. This is love. <laughs> this, this, this verse starts, it says, this is love. Immediately, your eyes must pop up and say, what is love? Let me read it. This is love. That we walk according to his commandments. That is, this is the commandment. What he says, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. If you walk according to his commandments, you have love. The love is already manifesting in you. And this is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Which is the commandment? You already been hearing it. Years and years, you've been attending the church, you have been reading the word of God, you know the commandments. And if you have read them, and if you know them, and you should walk in it, that is his commandment. Whatever you read, that's the reason God told Joshua in chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Meditate upon my word day and night, and you'll make your way prosperous. Why he said meditate? When you meditate, you will do the things that are written in my word. And that's the same thing has been repeated for us in Psalm 1. Those who meditate upon the word of God day and night, they'll be like trees planted on the riverside, bearing much fruit. Meditating. So if you meditate upon the word of God, you know what is command, that you have to walk in it. Furthermore, 1 John chapter 4. Verse 18, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. It's a serious word. Many of us in this world, many of you here in your homes, has some fear in your life. Some. It could be fear of people, fear of job, fear of losing job, fear of losing money, or fear of getting a sickness, fear of death, or various kinds of fear, not facing people, all kinds of fears. Some of those fears are in you, and some of them in me. If they are there, this word says, there is no fear in love. What this means is, if your love is not perfected, you will live on earth with certain kinds of fears. But what it says, but the perfect love casts out fear. Hallelujah. If you have the perfect love, brothers and sisters, it casts away all fears because, that was the reason I'll tell you, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. You know, when you love God and do every commandment of his perfectly, you will not be afraid some evil will come upon you. You know, Job, we know the book of Job very well. He himself was righteous, but he was concerned about his sons and daughters. They used to party a lot. So for some reason, they thought while partying, they may sometimes blaspheme God. So in order for them to be sanctified, Job used to do burnt offerings to God to sanctify his children because he was concerned they should not you know, lose their life. He was concerned. So he was doing all things right. However, somewhere back of his mind, he says, what feared that will come upon me has come upon me. He was such a perfect man. God called him. He's righteous. 
There is no man like him in the whole earth. That's what God said about him. However, he had some fear. What fear will, that will come upon me has come. What came upon him was so much of turmoil. Somewhere back of his mind is to think, if some problems come, what will I do? How will I do? I do not know whether love was perfected in him or not. But it's an example for us. Are you living with such fear on earth? Maybe you think, if death comes, what will I do? If sickness comes, what will I do? If, you know, somebody, you know, take, uh, the, harm me, what can I do? Or if my job goes today, what will I do? Oh, if my, if my finances, well, whatever invested investments I have made, if they just, just vanish, what will I do? These kind of fears you are living with. But if you love God and obey God, your faith in God will be so strong, knowing that your God will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what you live with. That's what you will talk about. That's what you will think. All the time what you think is, my God is with me. I will not live in fear. I love him. I obey him. I do the things that he told me to do. So I need not fear any situations in the world. The whole world may come against me. Like, like last week, uh, last time I said, Habakkuk, you know, chapter 3, verse 17. If there is no food, no stalls, no milk, nothing is there, I will not worry. I will trust the Lord and I will sing of his praises. That's what Habakkuk said. Similarly, you will say, my God will never leave me, nor forsake me. I trust him. I love him. So that's how you will not live in fear. Love means obeying God. When you obey God, you will not fear any situation. But if you have some feeling, oh, I made some mistakes yesterday. I didn't do this. You know, I have done oh, some faults the other day. I hated that person. I spoke wrong things about that man. I spoke, uh, uh, you know, uh, this and that. And I, I, I looked with uh, bad uh, eyes to somebody. You know, those kind of things which are in you, that means you are not obeying the word of God then fear will rule your heart. If you do not have faith, still fear will rule you. If you do not trust God the way you have to trust, you must trust that He is in total control of your life. Total control, my brother. Your finances, your health, your children, your family, and their future, your future is in His control. And Jesus gave us that word, not even one hair from your head will fall with his, without his firm permission. And he says, your hair are numbered. We never numbered our hairs. But he did. And he knows them. Hallelujah. But we always say, I love God. Oh, I love God. Really, I truly love God. That's what we keep saying. But how can we say and prove that we love God? There is a way with which this is very important for us now as we go. And we are going to talk about the, until now we spoke about the vertical love. Let's talk about the horizontal love, love towards people. Epistle of John, first epistle, chapter 4, verse 20 to 21. First epistle of John, chapter 4, verse 20 to 21. If someone says, I love God. Are you the one? You say that you love God? You love God? You say that you love God? I want to tell you what it says. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Let me emphasize that to you, brothers and sisters, this morning. If you say, or if you think in your heart that you love God, but if you hate your brother, your neighbor, any person around you, in your workplace, in your home, your own re relative, or in the church somebody, those who are with you, around you, if you hate them in any manner, if there is a kind of hatred in you, anger against them, because they do certain things against you. You're not angry simply. You have a reason to say, but that man does this to me. That man does things like this. Oh no, then you're angry with that person. Brothers and sisters, it says, he is a liar. Means you are a liar. And liars will not enter the kingdom of God. It's very, very clear. 
in Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. Very, very clear. Lies cannot enter the kingdom of God. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? That's what is the comparison. You have not seen. I have not seen God at any time. And we say we love God. If you love God, you will also love a man or a woman who is around you, who is also created by your God whom you love. You say love. Everyone. Now this is no, no, you cannot say I will love some believers. I love some Christians if they are okay. If some other religions, if they are an atheist, I will not love them. If they are another religion, I will not love them. You cannot have such a kind of a thought pattern in yourself. You must love anybody. Later on, towards the end, I'll talk about when that man asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus gave the story. The good Samaritan will go there. But then, anybody, everybody is your neighbor and your brother. Verse 21, it says, And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. The only proof, only proof that you have and which, with which you can brag about or talk about is that, that you say that I love God. You will know it only when you have loved your friend, your neighbor, with all your heart. Not just superficial, hypocritic love. People love or show love hypocritically. That's why there's a verse that says, let your love be without hypocrisy. Means in front they show love. They drip honey in, the, in, front, in front of people. But inside, they keep on thinking all negative things about them. That kind of love is abomination to God. There is a commandment to give to people of Israel's, Israelites. Book of Leviticus, chapter 19, verse 18. Look at this. Book of Leviticus 19, 18. It says, you shall not take vengeance. Hallelujah. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. He is, they were told, your Israelites, whoever it may be, even if they're wrong, why you want to take any vengeance? Because they're wronged against you. They made problem for you. Because they're done, you want to take vengeance. They hurt you. They caused some harm to you. They caused some loss to you. That's why you want to take vengeance. But the commandment is this. You shall not Take vengeance, not bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Are you with me this morning? This is important things. This is the commandment of God. If you want to say that I love God, you ought, ought to keep all the commandments of God. Not a few, not some. You must keep all the commandments and this commandment says you cannot even hate somebody. You cannot take vengeance on somebody or you cannot have grudge on anyone else. And if you do that, it says at the end what it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Why is he saying I am the Lord? It says my command. I am the Lord worth speaking this to you, not anybody. Not Moses. Not Peter or John or somebody. I am the Lord telling you, you cannot do this. That was good. That's more tolerable. I think we can do it, I think. But Jesus gave, Jesus went much further in this matter. Let's, so let's go and see what Jesus said. Book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to 46. I will read for you. Book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Ah, for Israelites, it was a commandment. You shall you love your neighbors, but hate your enemies. They had lots of political enemies who were killing them. So they were allowed to hate, hate them. But Jesus says in 44th verse, but I say to you, love your enemies. Can you? Can you? Can anybody? Can you love your enemy, those who hurt you? Those who are causing trouble to you, can you? 
I'm asking very straightforward, right into your eyes, brothers and sisters. This is the word. What it says, I say to you, love your enemies. This is the commandment given by Lord Jesus Christ. If you say, I love God, and that's the commandment, can you love your enemies? It's okay. I know you must be having enemies, and it's coming in your heart. How can I love? I'm not just going to condemn you on this. I'm telling you, it's possible. By the Spirit of the Lord, by the grace of God, by His Word, by His mercy, whenever you remember His love, when you take part in that communion, in that element, when you see the blood of Jesus in your hand and the body of Lord Jesus Christ in your hands, when you begin to see His sacrifice, when he forgave those people who crushed him, those people who nailed him, those people who pierced him, those people who, who scourged him. And you know, with all these people, say, forgive them if your father has done it. And because of that, you are forgiven from all your sins. Whenever you take that, you will get that same love. You know, what, we, what did we say? Have communion with Jesus when you take part in it. He will impart into you His love. And His love is such love that you can love your enemies. Only, what we said? Your mind. Your strength is what? Your mind. Your mind needs to be restructured. Your mind needs to be renewed by the word of God. Your mind needs to be transformed. If your mind, if you allow your mind, tell your mind, I need to obey God. Therefore, I'm going to love my enemy. Your mind will obey. The decision must come and command your mind. Do not obey your mind. Command your mind. Hallelujah. And do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Pray for them. This works, brothers. Works. This works. I have experienced not once in several times. The one who was troubling me in my workplace. People used to complain. He's troubling you so much. Why can't you go and complain? I said, I don't have to. I have another way to handle this. I'll pray. I kept on praying. God gave me justice in, the, in that case. The man was actually removed from that place who was troubling me. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to complain to anybody. This man used to actually impersonate me. I was his boss and he used to impersonate me tell that he was me. Or my place. God took him away. Verse 45. That you may be sons of your father in heaven. How many of you are sons and daughters of your father in heaven? Come on. Are you? Come on, speak up. Are you the sons and daughters of God? Hello? Yes, at least you people answer in the house. <laughs> now listen to this. Then if you are, what it says, that you may be sons and daughters, in bracket, of your father in heaven, for he makes his sons, not son, S-U-N, son, this bright son, to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and unjust. If you are sons and daughters of God, you must have the same nature like your Father in heaven. You must have the similar nature like your Father in heaven. You cannot have a different nature. Your sons and daughters, your own sons and daughters, you expect them to be at least like you. The good things that you do. And if you, you don't want them to do the bad things that you do, but the good things that you do, expect them to do. You tell them, say, I did this, you have to do this. Our Father in heaven is demanding the same. For you to be sons and daughters of God, you may have to love your enemies. Verse 46. For if you love those who love you, and reward, uh, and, and, and what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Everybody in the world, they call their friends for the partying. They call. They call their friends and have parties. You do the same. You only call those whom you like to your house. Are you thinking, I was going to announce a little bit later in this Christmas, unfortunately we will not be able to meet as we, this, we thought we will meet in a place. So we may have to do online service. I thought I will tell everybody, at least call one or two families, or two of, or three of you get together in one house on that day. Prepare a good meal while the service is gone. Keep it ready and after the service, come together, enjoy the presence of God in good fellowship. That's a good Christmas though. You can do that. 
But if you call only your friends, uh, this one is my friend, that one, no, no, that one I don't want to call. Try this time to call somebody whom you never called. You whom you don't talk in the church, probably never met them, but you find that number. Can you brother, can you sister, your family, we want your family to come to a house. Can you do that? Try this this time. If you love those who love you, it's nothing great. Now the question, who is our neighbor? Or who is our brother? And Jesus gave very clear direction in this matter. When that man came and asked him, who is my neighbor? In the book of Luke chapter 10, you'll find the story of Good Samaritan. That man said, who is my neighbor that I should love him? I should like him. Then, he starts with uh, the story. A man who was beaten up very badly and thrown on the street, on the side. And a Levite comes. A priest comes. They saw their own man is lying in blood. They didn't care. They just walked. Mm. They walked away. They didn't care for their own brother. A Samaritan man, verse 33, chapter 10, verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, the beaten up man. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Hallelujah. Say this word, compassion. When you see anybody in difficulty, there are many in this world, you must have that compassion. Have compassion on those arrogant people, particularly. Those who are against you. They talk bad about you. Those who cause trouble to you in your workplace. Those who are maybe so your friends, your neighbors. Have compassion. Must understand these people are led by the wicked spirit. That's what they do, what they are doing against you. That is not them. The wicked one is against you. So he causes them to trouble you. Have compassion. So this Samaritan did not say, he's a Jew, I don't have to help him. He did not say, they don't meet together, they don't talk together. He had compassion. He went, picked him up, put him on his donkey, taken him all the way to a good inn. And he stayed there and gave him food. He washed his wounds, you know, with, uh, with wine and he, uh, he bandaged him with oil. And every good thing he did. Next day when he was leaving, he told the innkeeper, I pay all that he, for him now. Even whatever happens tomorrow, he also gives some money. It will cover some more days. If he had to stay longer until he recovers, I'm going to come back on this way. I'll pay to you. Take care of him. This is, and Jesus tells, verse 36. Verse 36. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Then that man answers in verse 37, he who showed mercy on him. On anybody you show mercy, he is your neighbor. Or you see anybody in difficulty, he is your neighbor. It doesn't have to be your countryman. It doesn't have to be the same religion that you are. It doesn't have to be the uh, same kind of person that you are. If you see anybody, if you show compassion to him, he is your neighbor. Now, Jesus did not stop there. He gave one commandment to him, which is also for us. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. To whom he said this word? To that man, right? Does he say that word to us? Yes? Hello? Go and do likewise. Like the Samaritan. You must be like that good Samaritan. Because Jesus did the same thing towards us. We are not anyway close to him. We are not Israelites. But he died for us on the cross. Brothers and sisters, I just want to call your attention in your day-to-day -day life. You come across people who are in need. Whatever need it may be. What's your response? Your response will tell whether you have love or not. Suddenly somebody comes with your, someone who's working with you. He's in need. Even though he did not come and ask you. But you know that he's in need and he's struggling. And when you saw that person, what is your response? There are all kinds of people in this church. I know such people who immediately respond to anybody's need. 
I know such people within this church. If they know that somebody is in need, they quickly respond, what can I do? How can I help? They come and ask me many times. So I know them personally. I know, of course, those who do not ask me. So I don't know whether they have the same heart or not, but I don't know. So what is your response tells whether you have love or not? What about your colleagues who work with you or going through tough times? How do you respond to them? When it comes to your subordinates, you are a boss in a department. People work under you. How do you treat them? You have authority. You have authority to shout at them, command them, take them, away from, uh, take them out of the job. All these authorities that you have, how do you do things? How do you do? Yes, you need to get the work done, but you can talk to them politely. And they don't hear a couple of times. Yes, you can always take them out. There's nothing wrong about it. But do you do it very often? Do you have compassion on such people who are not able to meet your expectation because you, you are a boss, you have authority. If you have love, you'll show kindness to that person. Sometimes, some of us in our houses, people work to clean a house or sometimes to cook, to give some help in the house. We employ some people in a short time or a long time basis. This is where our real nature comes out. Some people say, if you want to know a person, what kind of a person that is, go and ask his servant who is working in that house. They will tell you. And it is true. How much they shout in their house, or how much anger they show, or how much they shout at each other, husband, wife, and children, all this information this person knows. How do you treat your cleaner in the house? Do you treat him as a human being or not? Or you treat him like some trash? Say anything that comes to your mouth. Say anything that you want to tell him. And shout him, why you did this? Why are you doing this? Why all this kind of nature? That's what you show. Then if you still say that you have love, question yourself this morning. What about your own family members who trouble you? And they are not blessed as much as you are blessed. And they still trouble you. They cause some problems, bring property problems or any other problems they bring. What is your response? You are like them or you're different than them? If somebody says, I, this property I will take away from you, will you be able to say, take away, I don't need it, my God will bless me? That's how you can show whether you have love of God in you or not. What about you face some absolute strangers? I've seen this in this country sometimes. We are in the car, we are just about to pull your car from your park, parking, and someone comes. It happens to me a number of times. And this is not some beggar. Beggars came, that is one thing. This person uh, uh, is not even a beggar. He's a good man, well-dressed, even in, in the Arab dress they had. And he says, excuse me, help me. I come from Saudi Arabia once. Once he said, I came from Qatar, somebody. And he said, I came and I lost my purse and wallet. And I have no cards, no cash. And I have to return back to my country. I don't even have money for petrol. Can you help me? What will you do? There are two things that you can do. They can be cheating you. Or maybe they're not cheating you. They may be telling the truth. You don't know. If you're in the spirit, you will know it. Even if, how do you respond? It has happened to me near the church. Most of the times it happened to me in the near the church. Just at the time I'm just pulling my car out of parking. Each time I said, okay, I cannot say no to him. Okay, I open my wallet. If I find some change, like a 50 or a 100, just give it to him. I cannot pay your whole petrol, but whatever I can, I'll do it. The reason I do this is my heavenly father will see what I'm doing. There was one priest in Abu Dhabi, St. Andrew's Church. We know him very well. He's no more here. I think he's also no more in the world. His name is Michael Mansbridge. He used to help people. Anyone goes to him, he used to help them. So one day, one man came and said, you're helping all these people. They're actually cheating you. They're not really needing help, but they're just coming to you. 
That man answered and said, I know sometimes that they cheat me. But in order for me to help one genuine man, I don't mind getting cheated by 99 people out of 100. I'll, I'll, at least I'll help one man out of all these people. So I don't mind. Let me do it. Good gesture. Think about it. How you respond to people. But there is a verse in the book of Philippians chapter 1. How we should be in discernment of things. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. And this I pray. That your love may abound still more and more. It should be more and more. In knowledge and discernment. You should have love. But it should be in knowledge and discernment. Verse 10, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense till the, the day of Christ. So you must operate your spiritual life in discernment and knowledge of God, that you should not be cheated by anybody. I'm reaching to the last. The final commandment given by Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples. Book of John. Chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. Book of John, chapter 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. He's telling us to love one another. And 35, he says, By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The only way you can give gospel to the world is the closeness among ourselves as children of God. How we love one another, how we comfort one another, and how we operate in this world. But unfortunately, there is so much of fights among the believers, among the Christians, between different denominations, between different, you know, churches, within the same church, we see fights and people in the world began to recognize it. Especially in India, if you go and see, there are people recognizing, oh, these Christians fight. That's what they're talking about. Because the true love has grown cold in the believers. That's why it is said, you know, Psalm 100 and 33, how good it is for brethren to live in love together in harmony. And it is compared to the anointing oil that came from Aaron's head to which flowed down to his, his, his coat. Love is very important. Why is love important? Let me go back to the beginning, the first scriptures I read from the book of Peter. Thank you, Jesus. 1 Peter 4, verse 7. 1 Peter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Verse 8. And about all these things, have fervent love for one another. That's why. The end days, you need to exercise love more. If you want to be fight with one another, say, because you find a fault with, I mean, we all find faults with others. It's very, very natural. There's nothing wrong to know a fault. But if you expose the fault, and because of the fault, you begin to fight with somebody, that is not godly, and that is not love at all. We need to cover the sins. What it says, love will cover a multitude of sins. And if, what, if that is what you want to happen, your sins must be covered. You must love. And you cover others' sins by showing love. When you do this, you demonstrate the love of the Father in this world. You are ready to be raptured. All the scriptures, all the messages we try to bring in these days to you is to prepare for you, prepare you for the rapture. God has protected us this 11 months, and brought us to this last month, the first week in December. It was His grace, His love for us. And if you don't respond back to Him by loving Him, that is obeying His commands, what kind of people we are? 
We are also expecting to enter the new year soon. Don't you want to enter this new year with the strength, that vigor, the spiritual vigor, doing great things unto the Lord? Don't you want to prepare yourself this month? Lord, I want to prepare myself to enter the eternity and also enter the new years, of course. Don't you want to pray? Don't you want to fast and spend time at the feet of the Lord? Take extra time to fast and spend at the feet of the Lord. Prepare yourself and find out if there is something lacking in you. Brothers and sisters, if you do that, you'll be blessed. This morning, I want to call your attention. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want to ask you, do you love God? Do you love God? And there is such power in loving God. And there is such power that will operate in you and through you when you love God and when you love people around you. You need to demonstrate that love. And what he said, you must have fervent love, not just love. Your love must be fervent. means even though you don't like somebody, you don't have enough love. Develop that love. Let it come from deep within you. Take that love out. And begin to love people. Thank you, Jesus. The presence of God is there wherever you are. And God is asking you, My son, my daughter, do you love me? Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Tend my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my lambs. Jesus asked Peter, today is asking you, do you love me? Can you love my other children in the world? Can you love those people who are around you? They've, there are people who are perishing without knowing me. Can you take this gospel to them? Do you love? In your office, there are people who are perishing. Your neighbors are perishing. If you love me, you will take my gospel to them. Thank you, Jesus. Do you need that love today? Maybe you do not have that love yet. Do you need that love today, this morning? God is asking you. God is asking me. All of us, if you want that love, God is willing to pour it upon you, now upon you. Get ready. The Spirit of Lord will pour His love. Only say, you lift your hands and say, Lord, I need that love. Wherever you are, you can stand up and begin to look unto Him in your homes also. Either stand up or kneel down. Sharbaha shakri karba. Even as this is sings the song. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, please give me a tender heart.
like love like your love. The presence of God is here. He will touch you wherever you are. Make up your mind. I said, your mind is your strength. Only if you make your decision, you can love your neighbor, not just neighbors, but you love your enemies. You love those who are not nice to you. There will never be a negative word against anybody on your mouth, in your mouth. You'll never simply be angry at anyone. Express your anger just because they have done something which you don't like. True love will cover all anger. If you want to know the nature of love, just go and read the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, chapter from the beginning till end. All the characteristics of love, what love does and what it doesn't do. Everything is written there. Take that in your heart. With the power, live with the power of love. Father, we thank you. Impart into your children everyone who said, I want to receive love. Impart into them, Father God. Pour your spirit upon them. Bless them, Father God, wherever they are. We give you glory, honor, and praise. Let this word bear fruit in everyone's life. In Jesus' most precious name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen.